So the evidence would lead us to conclude that the Sethians of the Vitristic writers did not exist as such, even though some of them uh, uh, describe a uh, heretic sect using the term Sethian, uh, Tertullian, uh, Hippolytus, Epiphanius, and others. We also note, of course, in the primary sources, not only in the Apocryphon of John, the prominence of Seth, son of Adam, and particularly the seed or race of Seth. So, this indicates that they were, there were Gnostics who regarded themselves metaphorically as the spiritual progeny of Seth, thus distinguishing themselves from the rest of humankind. So, <clears throat> what we have then in our primary sources that we have uh, listed uh, are sources that lead scholars to posit this uh, Sethian mythological system. Of course, there are many differences to be observed among the texts comprising the Sethian corpus. Some of them are clearly Christian texts featuring Jesus as the revealer of Gnosis. We noted that Jesus is equated with Seth in some of these writings. That Seth puts on or becomes incarnate as Jesus is also a tradition noted by some of the church fathers in their accounts of Sethians. Yet, some of the primary texts that, that, uh, that we have available to us have no Christian elements at all. <clears throat> the differences that we have observable among the writings of the Sethian corpus would, of course, make it very difficult for us to reconstruct any kind of Sethian social history, even though such a heroic task has been um, undertaken by my dear friend uh, John Turner, who is a, a real expert on Sethian Gnosticism. Also, it should be uh, remembered that the Sethian writings we have reflect a ritual praxis. Two rituals can be seen reflected in them. There's baptism and a ritual of ascent. The Gospel of the Egyptians is particularly important for its prayers associated with baptism, and the three steles of Seth for its prayers associated with the ascent ritual. And here I think in terms of a corporate uh, liturgy of people who are experiencing a kind of trance-like state, the ascent of their souls to the uh, realm above. So we can clearly uh, talk about a rit ritual praxis involving group activity with a structured religious life. Even if we're not, one cannot refer to a church of Sethian Gnostics. Um, and of course it should be also said that Gnostic teachers obviously had a great deal of freedom to introduce innovations in the myths or rituals embraced by them and their followers. I suppose there was as much freedom among the ancient Gnostics in that regard as there is among modern Gnostics. <laughs> Even if our sources do not allow us to reconstruct the social history of Sethianism, it is possible to propose, in broad outline, a history of Sethian or classic Gnostic traditions. The Apocryphon of John, the most important of the Sethian texts, reveals a kind of tradition history. It reflects an editorial Christianizing of an originally non-Christian Gnostic myth. This pos posited myth has features in common with those of the uh, earliest attested uh, Gnostic prophet teacher, Simon Magus, and uh, a, a teacher that comes after him, Menander. So it is not unfeasible to posit a first century origin for the very basic myth that we developed as we have it in the Apocryphon of John. The use made in it of biblical and Jewish traditions clearly reflects its Jewish origin. Christian Gnosticism as such is first attested in the early second century with Saturninus of Antioch. So the incorporation of the figure of Jesus Christ into Sethian Gnostic mythology is a second century phenomenon. 
Finally, the third century Platonizing Sethian texts reflect the incorporation incorporation of Middle and Neoplatonic school traditions into the Sethian Gnostic tradition. Adherence of this variety of Gnosticism, which lacks any Christian features, attracted the attention of Plotinus and members of his school in Rome sometime in the third quarter of the third century, around 260. But different varieties of Christian Gnosticism utilizing Sethian traditions persisted into the 4th century as attested by the church father Epiphanius and the compilers of the untitled text of the Bruce Codex. Now, <clears throat> that's not the complete story because you know, there are 52 tractates in the Nagamati corpus alone plus those of uh, Berlin Gnostic and others. Sethian Gnostic traditions came to be incorporated into a large number of tractates in the Nagamati collection that are not normally included in, this, in that list of Sethian uh, texts. And, not least, this is very important, the greatest of all of the second century Gnostic Christians, Valentinus of Alexandria, based his own methodological system on that of the Gnostic school of thought, if Irenaeus is to be believed. And of course he is, because you can clearly see in Valentinian mythology uh, developments of myth, mythic uh, features found in Apocryphon of John and other uh, Sethian or classic texts. And of course Basilides of Alexandria is another very famous Christian teacher who should not be ignored in this, uh, uh, in this context, although we don't have any extant uh, complete writings of his preserved. There are a few fragments that uh, Irenaeus has. And Hippolytus uh, describes a system of Basilidians who uh, uh, represent a later version of Basilidian Gnosis than that of Basilides himself. Well, that's about all I've got to say, except uh, now it's time for further discussion, if uh, you're so inclined. The characterization that you give of uh, the Apocryphon of John as uh, what seems to be a, uh, a Hellenized Jewish text, and, and, and please correct me if I'm, if I'm misstating your position here, uh, a Hellenized Jewish text that has a later Christian reaction that comes in the form of a sort of a beginning and an ending piece. This, this is, I think, very, very striking uh, in light of the claim made by Massenburg Ford. And I mentioned uh, Professor Ford uh, before, and I, I saw you sort of nodding your head, so I know that you're I know. Well familiar with her work. Um, this is the same claim that she makes for the Book of Revelation. Yeah, well, that's a Baptist text with yeah. uh, Christian extrapolations. Do you think that there's what yeah, I, with respect to her view of the book of Revelation, I have some uh, questions about it. But of course, uh, I must uh, immediately say uh, I'm absolutely no specialist in the book of Revelation. So uh, I'll let her have a, a more final word on that. <laughs> um, one question I have, and I mean, you know, I... Yeah, there's all sorts of people, you know, on the net, off the net, that like to, you know, debate and talk back and forth about things. And you know, I, I've never, uh, um, you know, in a John Macquarie type fashion, I've never been a, a, a believer in, you know, I guess a certain degree of priests or rather uh, bishops in being theologians. They should stick to, you know, <laughs> signing checks or organizing things. You know what I mean? They should, they should stick to you know, kind of guiding and governing rather than so and so I've, I've stayed out of, of debates and things intentionally but one thing I did want to pick, pick your brain on because I, I see different people kind of going back and forth on it and I, I mean I'm not qualified to say who's right or who's, who's not um, is the issue at least with let's say uh, classic Gnostic 
some or maybe some of the other uh, Gnostic groups like uh, Valentinus, for example, about the issue of uh, uh, dualism, emanations, and monism, for example, like what mm. uh, uh, you know, and, and, and by no means am I looking for something that kind of agrees with my own worldview. I, I mean, myself, uh, you know, I would consider myself a pan and theist. Um, you know, mm. in the sense of a transcendent and imminent in, in, in uh, mm. uh, deity who, you know, everything is contained mm. within, yeah, but yeah. that deity is, mm. is beyond. And that's kind of how, you know, I've always seen, um, you know, things like emanations and the aroma as, as, as essentially being monism. Um, and I might well. be mangling terms here, but... Um, in terms of in terms of classical Gnostics or maybe some other Gnostic groups, were they strict dualists? Were they monists? Were they well? Well, uh, uh, as we've seen in the myth, it starts out monistic. The invisible spirit is a monad. <laughs> yeah, and it's a tragic split within the within the divine world that results in a dualism. But then, every, then everything's put back together again eventually. So it's a preference for, for monism, I guess you might say. Um, two questions. Um, what, uh, what made you choose Gnosticism as a field of study, and what was it like working on the original translations of the Gnostic library? How did you come to be involved in that? And did you bring us all on? <laughs> Somebody asked me that yesterday at lunch, and I said it's a long story, but I guess I'll, I'll tell it in as brief a fashion as I can. Um, I was a uh, seminarian at Pacific Lutheran Theological Seminary in Berkeley uh, when, in 1959, the Gospel of Thomas was first published. And in that version, published by a group of scholars, there was facing page Coptic and English translation. I became exceedingly uh, interested in that particular text. And as a, uh, already by then, a master's degree in classics, I, of course, knew my Greek. And I could spot numerous Greek words in the, in the text of the Coptic, but most of it was gibberish. <laughs> and naturally, it's Egyptian. It's not Greek at all. So I decided that if I were accepted into a graduate school, um, I would uh, try to study Coptic. And fortunately, I arrived at Harvard in 1962 and uh, started Coptic with Tom Lambden, one of the greatest teachers of uh, Semitics and Egyptian that I have ever met. Uh, he also taught Ethiopic, which I took there too. But I've forgotten all of my Ethiopia. Uh, then, uh, either my second year there or my third, I forget which it was, Chelis Quispel of Utrecht uh, came and spent a whole year at Harvard as a visiting professor. Uh, he, at Harvard, he had a, a, a lecture course on Gnosticism which I thought I audited and I thought was very interesting. Uh, but even better, uh, he was one of the members of the Monopoly who contr controlled the Jung Codex and uh, Codex One, an Agamotti collection. And he had with him a, an unpublished version of the Coptic text of the, uh, the, apoc uh, the apoc apocryphal epistle of James. Um, which is one of the tractates in the Jung Codex. So those of us who knew a little Coptic, uh, I think there were four of us, met together with him, and he handed out copies of the text of the uh, Epistle, Epistle of Jacobi, which they called it eventually in their, tra in their uh, uh, published version. Uh, but there was a very strict provision made. We had to swear that we would hand back at the end of the course <laughs> our <laughs> texts 
because it wasn't published yet. And Huespo was one of those notorious monopolizers that were, <laughs> were exposed by Jim Robinson in a famous article much later. Well, I, I, I wasn't done with my degree yet when I left Harvard. I had yet to uh, finish the last chapter of my dissertation. Nevertheless, uh, I got a job at Duke University in North Carolina, and uh, I think it was a, the yeah the second year I was there. Second year I was there. Um, I was there from '66 '69. James Robinson was putting together his uh, group of people at Claremont working on the Nakamati uh, text. The reason he was putting this together and the reason that he could put it together was that he had been to Paris and he had managed to talk the UNESCO people there into giving him microfilms of all of the Nakamati uh, texts that uh, had been microfilmed and he made prints and uh, his intention was to hand out these prints of the Coptic uh, uh, version uh, of all these Don Kamadi tractates to members of a team that would work on it and eventually uh, published a one volume edition of Nakamadi treatises. Um, fortunately, uh, well, he came around to Duke University and, and uh, had the name of one professor there at Orville Wintermute. But uh, fortunately, my teacher, Helmut Kuster, had uh, recommended me to Jim. So uh, Jim got me, Orville Wintermute, and then one of Orville's graduate students uh, involved in the Coptic Gnostic project. And um, I got a grant from Duke to go out and spend the whole summer at Claremont working on Codices 9 and 10. Uh, I thought at the time, and still do, that I got the bum end of the stick. Because <laughs> these were very fragmentary, and Codex 10 is particularly uh, awful. <laughs> but, you know, I, I worked on it as best I could and, and uh, worked for a whole summer. Uh, and during that summer, uh, I got an invitation from... Uh, the Department of Religious Studies at uh, at uh, Santa Barbara to come be interviewed for a position taking over a position vacated by Jonathan Z. Smith who had moved to Chicago. So I went to be interviewed uh, at uh, Santa Barbara. They paid for a Greyhound bus ticket to go to Santa Barbara. <laughs> 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 and uh, eventually what issued from that was an invitation to join the faculty at Santa Barbara. So uh, that I did so that by uh, uh, June of 1969 I was uh, in Santa Barbara and on the faculty at UC Santa Barbara. But then also though I, I spent th that summer as well in Claremont. I commuted back and forth, spent the week down there and weekends uh, at home. And uh, we would, uh, you know, uh, work as a team, all of us sitting around uh, a big table with all of our texts. And, and sometimes we'd ask questions of one another, or ask this and that and the other about where this fragment they thought should go here. And um, so we did that. And in the meantime, UNESCO had put together a project uh, and had chosen a group of uh, scholars to head it up to re-photograph all the Nagamati texts. But in order to do that, and to produce a facsimile edition, but in order to do that, uh, this involved studying the ancient manuscripts themselves, and uh, they were in a pretty much of a muddle. You know, they were stuck together in plexiglass uh, containers, and that's what we <laughs> saw in our black and white photos. And the job of the UNESCO team was to uh, uh, make a completely new uh, uh, 
collection of photographs based on a re the reconstructed uh, Nagamati codices, um, which was done correctly in, in glass panes with uh, you know, and the the papyrus uh, fragments were were placed with particular kinds of uh, papyrus plus glue and stuff. And um, as these, there were several seasons. First one started in 1971, and then there was one 73, 74, uh, and we'd meet, meet for three weeks in December uh, in the Coptic Museum in Old Cairo, working on these uh, texts. And I, I was assigned nine, codices nine and ten. Sir and Giverson and I worked together on Codex nine. Uh, and um, but I was assigned Codex 10, and no, of course nobody else wanted that. It's a jumble, of, <laughs> terrible jumble of fragments. Even figuring out the title of the of the of, of the tractate, there's only as so far as I can tell, there's only one tractate in the fragments of Codex 10. Um, and there was one fragment that, that had part of a name on it. With, and you could tell it was a title because of the of these sub and super linear strokes that, that were over the Coptic text. And, uh, one day I had a, a, a light vision. Aha, I think, I think I know what that is. Because... Uh, I think, if I remember correctly, what was on the text was something like... Um, I should actually I put dots underneath. Um, and then this uh, super linear stroke here. And super linear stroke here. The dot underneath each of these indicates uncertain letters. And I puzzled over that for months and months and months. And I finally was reading a bunch of stuff. Uh, I think I remember reading uh, Jean Dores's book on, on the uh, uh, Nagamati find. It was one of the first bu books published. And he, he mentioned all the traditions associated with the Gnostics and, and mentioned the name of a Gnostic prophet named Marsanes from Syria. <coughs> and then so I filled in And this is the mu, alpha, rho, sigma, and the alpha, nu, uh, eta, and sigma. Uh, Marsanis, which is the name of the tractate that I labored for 10 years on. So uh, anyway, that's the story. I'll tell you what, I mean, you asked me how it felt to be involved in that project. <laughs> well, it felt damn good. I mean, <laughs> I got a real kick out of it. <laughs> did, you, did you realize at the time um, just how momentous this find had been and, and how important this work was? I had some inkling of it, but uh, it's become clearer since. Certainly for us, this is, this is foundational. Yeah, for sure. This is, this is the first, the first volume of the uh, of the Nakamati, uh, I think it's ten volumes or twelve volumes of uh, of photographs. Uh, the first volume, I think, was published in 17, 1972. It consists of Codex Seven, which is absolutely the best preserved. It's all virtually nothing missing from it. So. Uh, uh, that was the easiest one to to put together. Then I think the last of them were published 1977, I think. And uh, it was also in that year that the the Nakamati Library in English came out. I 
Yes. Which, which I, I found interesting because I'd always had it associated in my head and maybe I was thinking, you know, the Valentinians. Valentinians. Uh, yeah. Participation in, in, the, in the great church, and that's where I kind of, uh, you know, had it, uh, had it jumbled because at first I, you know, I thought it was like a giant, you know, wait, I thought, I thought they, I thought they did, but the, uh, uh, were there, uh, so the Sethian Gnostics didn't. Right. Now, so far as we can tell. And there's an awful lot of material now to look at. Uh, well, I mean, uh, in terms of terminology, we use this term Gnosticism. And uh, and then, uh, you know, Apocryphon of John is, uh, is a variety of what I would call Christianized Gnosticism, uh, secondary Christianization. But Valentinus and Basilides, I would say, should better be called Gnostic Christians. In other words, uh, they are more Christian than they are anything else. Uh, and their Christianity is, is rooted in their study of uh, Paul and John particularly. And, uh, uh, and what they do, of course, with the Gnostic sources they use, uh, they adapt them. And uh, that's what Irenaeus says, and is absolutely, he's, uh, was absolutely right. You can compare uh, the Valentinian material with the with Pock and John, for example, and see all the resemblances, but also the huge differences. I suspect that group looked like they used the Pock and John with the textbook. What form do you imagine they might take? Boy, that's a good question. Um, we should remember one thing about all of these 4th century Coptic manuscripts. They were found um, in a Christian cemetery as part of a Christian cemetery outside of some caves used as burial caves by monks. Um, and the closest monastery uh, to this site of the burial of the jar, jar containing the manuscripts as at a place called in ancient, uh, ancient Greek Hainoboskion but uh, 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 well, the name escapes me now uh, in uh, Egyptian but in any case uh, or, or Arabic uh, but anyway uh, that was a Pacomian a member of uh, monastery of the Pacomian order which was based at that time late, uh, at a site called Pabao or Tabanese and so there was a whole row of monasteries in, in Egypt in, in the 4th century uh, that were part of that Pacomian order and I'm quite convinced myself that all of the Nakamoti codices were copied in Coptic in that monastic system now, uh, they were copies of copies, and I don't know where, and where the original Greek versions came from, that of course is, they certainly didn't come from there, they probably came down from Alexandria, but, um, but uh, it's becoming increasingly clear to scholars uh, who have worked on, on these materials for so many years that one can see uh, clearly Egyptian Christian uh, uh, influences in the way in which these uh, texts are put together and copied and uh, uh, you know you, I'm sure there are some uh, scribal additions and changes made to the text reflecting a, a monastic provenance Does this idea ever uh, find yourself mentally kicking yourself when you think about the ones that the uh, lady threw in the fire? <laughs> Stove. In, in terms of the discovery, you know, well, yeah. I, I remember you know going through um, you know the Robinson edition of the Doc and, and you know reading in the, the story at the beginning how they were found and they were you know brought home and then you know is there a gin in here and you know and all of a sudden you know, kind of stop and it's like well I'm just gonna you know toss these. We're working on. Codex 10 for all those years. I cursed that woman <laughs> more than once <laughs> because I was convinced that part of the stuff that she cooked tea with or, or used in her bread oven uh, were fragment was pages from my manuscript. <laughs> is the, is the, the uh, 
uh, some you know, scholarship that these have a Greek origin because of the use of Greek terminology within the, the Coptic Codex? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and the use of Greek syntax. Can you, can you talk a little bit about the, the five seals and how that relates to uh, the broader Sethian tradition and salvation? I can talk about it, but I'm not sure I'll be able to answer your question to any great satisfaction because uh, there are several texts, Apocrypha and John is one of course, and then there are some other ones that refer to the five seals, and this is clearly a baptismal ceremony. Now, what are these five seals? Now, some uh, one, one guy that's worked on, on this Sethian Gnostic material uh, most extensively is Jean Severin. And he's written, you know, a whole big book on this and includes discussion of five seals. But uh, other scholars have worked on the five seals and have come up with different interpretations. Uh, the, the, the problem is that in the, in the texts that discuss the five seals in the larger context, references are made to other ritual actions. So um, there's... Uh, uh, renunciation and, and there's uh, uh, ano uh, anointing there's also coronation and, and things of this sort that some of the texts refer to in which also the context is, uh, in, in the context the reference is made to five seals so my own view is that the five seals represent uh, represent uh, applications of water, act real water. I mean, the, the apocalypse of Adam has been interpreted by some to say this is an anti-baptismal. No, I don't think so at all, no. Uh, it might be ba based on a very uh, difficult passage at the end of the apocalypse. But anyway, the five seals are five uh, ablutions. And uh, in associated with each of these ablutions is uh, something else that happens alongside of the ablution. Uh, as part of a, a whole uh, ritual of, uh, of a, a ceremony consisting of five main parts. So that's the way I would interpret it. And would that be once for a degree kind of thing? Do one and come back and do another? No, I think it would be uh, all in one... Uh, uh, on one occasion. Yeah. But it would be a long ritual, but uh, it would be uh, in, involve several s stages. I've, uh, I've written a, a book on, uh, uh, not a book, but a, an article on Sethia and Gnostic baptism in which I discuss that whole problem. And it's coming out in a three-volume thing uh, edited by uh, 